Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. First of all, thank you to all subscribers for supporting me in the comments. I really appreciate it. And for today, we have three good stories. The first story is, Girlfriend tells me to get lost? Don't mind if I do. Or, How I taught my ex to not break up unless you mean it. Let's set the stage. This story takes place a little while ago. I was a young university student, 24 male, dating a beautiful girl, Hannah, 23 female, who I believed I would be marrying in the next year or two. While Hannah and I didn't meet under the best circumstances, our relationship kicked off and was passionate nonetheless. We seemed to get along just fine. We spent most of the time in Hannah's apartment, not far from campus, where I'd spend the night since I was commuting to school. This story takes place about 16 months into our relationship. Before I go on, I should mention that both Hannah and I had some rough relationship troubles prior to meeting one another. She was seeking help for her mental health, but stopped six months into our relationship. Mental health issues that culminated in her cheating on her previous partner. I was no angel either. A medical scare three years prior put me in a depressive state that also led me down a similar path. However, after some major life changes, I found myself dedicated to my future career and to my relationship. Hannah and I were very open about our past and talked very often whenever there were issues, or so I thought. But this isn't a story about a happy couple, and you, my dear Redditor, are here to read about spite and malicious compliance. Cue to the fateful night. I'm cuddling Hannah in her bed after she experienced an emotional scare, when she begins a discussion about exes and boundaries, relating to her ex texting her that evening. We discuss people propositioning others in relationships, leading to me admitting to Hannah that one of my coworkers was interested in me, but I turned them down early in our relationship. Hannah flips, asks why I never told her sooner, demands to see my phone, attempts to extract messages from it, and then tells me to go home. In her mind, me not telling her meant that I had led my coworker on. Spoiler alert, I didn't. Kicked out of her place, I slink home wondering what I did wrong. Hannah doesn't want to talk that night, and the following day she tells me she's not ready to talk either. She only tells me that she's taking the week to herself to think this over, and I shouldn't text her. I'm compliant. I wait. Despite an awful week involving a family member's emergency surgery followed by a major exam, I refrain from texting her. It's what she wanted after all. Six days later and she asks me to meet at a coffee shop halfway across the city. Cool, I'm compliant, so I make my way down. She shows up, so do four of her friends. They all sit down and the first words out of Hannah's mouth are, so how many other women are there? She believes I've been cheating. She believes I've been flirting with women behind her back and that I somehow had a long list of concubines, all because I refused to sleep with a coworker and brushed it off over 12 months ago. I made the mistake of trying to defend myself, which only made her more angry at me and resulting in her friends telling me to get lost and never come back. My last words to her were, if you're serious, I'll go, but the minute I walk out that door, don't expect me to come back. They were met with a final you should leave by her and her friends. I go to the hospital, visit my relatives, come home, game with friends, and go to bed. The next morning I wake up to a text from Hannah. It reads, we're done. I'm hurt and can't really make heads or tails of what just happened, but I know I need to respect her decision. I'm also just a little angry that she believes I cheated on her, despite my dedication to the relationship. Now, dear reader, if you've made it this far, then in the wise words of Anakin Skywalker, this is where the fun begins. Later that night I receive a text from her friend. It's long-winded, asking me about my side of the story and what happened. Obviously, Hannah ran to them to say what happened, and this friend was trying to mend burned bridges. I don't reply. I was told to get lost. I'm compliant and I respect her decision. We're done. I block her friend. The following morning, I receive a text from her mom, explaining that this was all a big misunderstanding and that Hannah wants to talk it through and that I should come over. I reply saying that I'm helping my family member recovering from surgery and not to text me again. I am compliant and I respect Hannah's decision. A few hours later, I receive a message from her sister asking what happened since Hannah has been distraught and crying all day. She begs me to call and talk to Hannah, who's begging to clear up this misunderstanding. I ignore and block her. I am compliant and I respect Hannah's decision. The next message comes from her mom again. Hannah had stolen her phone and sent a long message about how I'm ghosting her by not replying. I block that number too. I'm not ghosting, I'm being compliant. She said get lost and so I did. The following day, her friends repeatedly try to call me. Each one is ignored and blocked. Finally, I get a text from a number I don't recognize. It's Hannah from a burner phone, telling me how this was a misunderstanding. She doesn't apologize, but does state that this ghosting is childish. I block that number too. 
I'm compliant and respectful, and since she said we're done, we're done. I want to say that this story ends here, but it doesn't. A month passes with no contact from Hannah at all, until I log into Reddit and see a message from a brand new account. The message is from Hannah, who goes into detail about how my ghosting has resulted in multiple mental breakdowns, resulting in her hospitalization, and that my family and friends are idiots for supporting me. She demands that I reply instantly and that I help her through this, because that's what good couples do. I don't reply, I simply block and ignore. I'm compliant and I respect her decision. This time, however, Hannah won't stand for it. I wake up the next morning to my Reddit account deleted. During the night, Hannah had deciphered my password. I had used her Wi-Fi at her apartment and I remember logging in once on her laptop and deleted my account. Being a dumb university student, this required me to change all my passwords and logins as I was silly enough to keep them all the same. What followed was a call to a lawyer and her family. Honorable mention at this time to Reddit admin who followed up by reinstating my account minus prior messages and chats. Her dad answered the phone. He explains to me that as before, our argument was all a misunderstanding and that we can patch things up if I just talk to her. I tell him that she broke up with me, to which he's surprised. I take it she never told him the full story and told him that my accounts had been hacked by somebody at her IP address. I tell him that if she contacts me again, I will be involving a lawyer in the police. I hang up after that, not giving him a chance to reply. If you've kept reading until now, dear Redditor, then I'm sorry to say there's no climactic ending to this story. I didn't hear from Hannah again afterwards. As far as I know, she's dating someone new, who ironically looks exactly like me, and who I hope won't have to deal with this either. As for myself, I dedicated my time to furthering my education, and in doing so met someone who treats me with the love and care I believe I deserve. I have some inkling that at some point Hannah might try to message me again. Throughout our relationship, she was notorious for texting exes, to try and discuss how their relationship went. But for now, I sleep soundly knowing I was a good boyfriend, who did exactly what she said. I was compliant and I respected Hannah's decision. I got lost and never came back. The second story is, wait for security. For privacy reasons, I'm being vague. This didn't happen to me, but I did witness it. Background. For the last five years, I've worked in a rural office of a large organization, ORG, in Outback, Australia. I work four hours away from the main building. ORGs receive various amounts of government funding for lots of community programs. As such, ORG has a main building, several hubs in the same town, and a few hub offices in different towns. Like my office, not part of this story. ORG has a volume of maintenance and security concerns, which they contract out to Security and Maintenance Company, which I will refer to Security Co. The contract between Security Co. and ORG is very clear, regarding expectations of both companies, costs outlined and burden of costs relating to oversights, important for later. The contract is renegotiated every three years and is profitable for Security Co. if all goes well. Security Co. is in charge of maintenance and security for main office and all offices within 20 kilometers of the main office. I have a few friends across the org and we meet up for drinks when I'm required to work in main office, which is about two to three times a year. During my first visit to the main office on 2018, as usual, I met with a few friends, Aaron, account department, Kevin, contract department, and John, manager of a hub. For the story, I need to explain John manages a hub that's required to be staffed 24-7. Eight workers a shift, three shifts a day. Hub is located in an SH part of town, known for violence, drugs, and theft. As such, workers require security present during shift change to make sure workers get to and from their cars without issue. It's company policy, as workers have been mugged in the past. Over a few drinks, John told us that Security Co. appointed a new manager that oversees security for the hubs. I will call him Butthole. Butthole was hired after his predecessor retired. Management in Security Co. receives a bonus each year if their department runs at a profit. Before Butthole, security ran smoothly and turned small bonus for manager, wanting a bigger bonus. Butthole decided to reduce his department's cost by hiring less guards. This affected John's staff, as security guards were not always present during shift change. John spoke to Butthole, who promptly responded with, If your workers have to wait, then so be it. We'll get there when we get there. Do I tell you how to manage your staff? No? Then bugger off and leave me run mine. John was just venting as he was annoyed at this situation. Kevin broke out the biggest smile and said if you play your cards right, you can really F Butthole over. Kevin explained how Security Co. is expected to reimburse org any costs resulting from negligence or oversight in Security Co.'s behalf, something Butthole is probably not aware of. At this point, Aaron started laughing and said if employees can't leave because it's too unsafe, then they're entitled to get pay until they can leave, including overtime. This overtime would be considered a reimbursement cost, according to the contract. You could see the light bulb go off in John's head as an evil smile creeped on his face, and he said, we will wait for security like Butthole said. 
The next part John told me via phone calls over the coming months. John sent Butthole an email, informing him that the lack of security is causing a financial concern for John's department, as workers get overtime until security guards arrive. Butthole replied with, I'll keep that in mind, confirming receipt of the email. For the next month, John emailed Butthole daily with shift change times and told his employees to log when security arrived, as that's when they clock off. Security would always arrive one to three hours late, one night not even showing. This caused a massive amount of overtime for workers, and due to industrial relations laws, casual workers were rosted on to cover shifts that assigned workers were no longer allowed to work, minimum 16-hour break between shifts in this field. All in all, payroll in John's department was up by $50,000 in one month. John was called into the CEO's office for this budget blowout, along with Aaron, account rep. CEO, John, explain why this month's payroll is over $50,000. John, because employees had to stay back and wait for security. They can't leave work until security arrives, and since Butthole arrived, they're always late or not showing up. CEO, what, and the workers cannot walk themselves to the car? Aaron, sir, this site requires security, due to the location and risk of assault. And regarding the pay, employees are entitled to be paid if they're unable to leave the work site. CEO, well, SH, what can we do about this? We can't keep this up. John, is Security Co. responsible for reimbursements for any costs resulting from negligence or oversight? Aaron, I believe so. CEO, you planned this, didn't you, John? John said nothing as he handed CEO a folder with every email he sent to Butthole. In the end, Security Co. repaid the $50,000. Butthole lost his bonus and more security guards were hired. And the last story is, I wouldn't toss those. A few years ago, before I moved my way up into engineering, I was a machinist. One of the most common tools of the trade are calipers. I had purchased a fairly nice pair of digital calipers, since they were my main tools, aside from the more accurate $100,000 equipment. The company paid for all the calibration needs for everything, even if they were your own personal equipment. They would not pay for personal equipment that was broken due to negligence, which is completely fair. We have this guy that always has an attitude, no matter what. He's always complaining about something. He likes to go to each department that his parts are incoming from and check the parts to make sure they're to his liking. I didn't run his parts too often, but when I did, he was making his way towards me like clockwork three times a day, freaking annoying. When he did, he would pick up my personally owned calipers and use them. Now, I didn't mind because I didn't want to give him another thing to complain about until he started tossing the calipers down. First time I seen him do it, they bounced on my bench a bit. I flat out told him, don't toss those around. They're expensive and they're my personal calipers. He walks away spouting something off under his breath. He did it a second time. I reminded him that they were my personal set and if he was going to be using them, he needed to respect them. He muttered, it won't hurt them. They aren't meant for accuracy. Sure enough, the third time's a charm. He came over being nosy and tossed my calipers on my bench after using them. After the third time, I went to the supervisor and had a chat with him about these incidents. He pulled the employee in question in and talked to him. The next morning, I was doing my reference checks on the parts and sure enough, here comes Mr. Attitude, marching his way into my department. I tried to quickly grab my calipers up and replace them with my spares, but I didn't get the chance. He picks them up and he finishes checking what he needs and tosses them down. At this point, I'm biting my tongue. As he walks away, I pick my calipers up and my screen is messed up and doesn't read out. At this point, I'm fuming, so I take the calipers to my supervisor and told him he did it again and they're broke now. Supervisor tells me that he told Mr. Attitude that he breaks them then he will buy them. Sure enough, a week later I received a brand new pair of calipers, same ones, ordered by the company and pulled out a Mr. Attitude's check. From that day on he brought his own calipers whenever he needed to check something. I guess he didn't want to be short $350 again. Subscribe to the channel if you want to know when the new video comes out. Thank you for watching.